Hey guys, this will be your weekend video notes. Um, I'm going to, because of where I am, I don't really have a way to do a computer and all that to, uh, together to show you with the PowerPoint. Um, so what I'm going to end up doing for this is sending the PowerPoint out so you can basically, you know, play the video in the background, look at the PowerPoint as I talk. Um, because it's the weekend notes and you can pause and stop at will, I'm going to give you essentially a day's worth of notes in a, in a half hour. So this will probably still be two videos. Um, but then I'll, um, go, I'll go kind of quick. So I'm going to kind of just read and, um, and just go as fast as I, not as fast as I can, but go fra fairly fast. Um, but essentially you're going to get a day wor day's worth of notes. Based on kind of where I have it now, uh, we would come in Monday and do probably 10, 15 minutes of notes and be done with unit six. Um, and then, we'll, like we said, we'll start unit seven and then test on Tuesday, so all that's still in play. Um, but anyway, so that's, that's kind of where we're leaving off now, or picking up from where we left off on Friday. Um, we were just talking, so if, if you want to follow with me, I'm on slide uh, a, hang on. Slide A17, New Patterns of Marriage Towards the Bottom with Education. Uh, and I'll kind of start where I left off. We said that Czech educator John Amos Comenius developed the first comprehensive system of universal education, which was influenced by the Enlightenment. Or, I'm sorry, he actually influenced the Enlightenment, excuse me. In the late 1700s, Prussia became the first nation to implement compulsory universal, universal education. It provided free public education for boys and girls 6 to 8, 13. It required, and this is something new we didn't cover on Friday, it required teacher training, universal curriculum, and mandatory kindergarten. So uh, Prussia or the Germans are the ones who developed kindergarten training. This effective model spread in Europe. They also taught folk tales that helped build national language and national identity. So that was one of the other benefits of doing things like folk traditions or folk tales to help build identity for your country as well as language because you because a lot of different areas of countries don't have the same language or the same way they use words, so this helps kind of unify a lot of languages when education becomes more the norm in this late 1700s and 1800s. All right, so this will bring us to slide 18, which is impact of consumer revolution. By the end of the 18th century, a high proportion of European Europe experienced unprecedented levels of relative material prosperity. Many centuries before were dominated by scarcity. Now you have this consumer revolution, which we talked about the consumer revolution, consumer revolution here a few times, um, but this propel, was propelled by a lot more disposable income. So by the 1700s, you have a growing middle class, wages are out there, more disposable income. This swept across Europe, bringing both a desire for consumer goods and an unfamiliar ability to afford at least some of them, especially with city dwellers. So the consumer revolution propelled by the dispensable income or disposable income, um, especially for middle class, swept across Europe in the 1700s, bringing in both a desire for consumer goods and an unfamiliar ability to afford at least some of them, especially with city dwellers. All right, increase in commercial production. Pre-industrial Europe saw home as also a site of production. Now with merchants and wage earners, you could uh, buy, buy for desire rather than, than necessity. So you, people now that have wages can go buy goods for their homes to decorate their homes, uh, just to make it look better. You don't have to buy at necessity or at a function. Wealthy saw luxury items and fashion as a way to display their economic status. This was seen in the masses with cheaper fashions and edibles. So basically it impacts all levels of society because what happens is that the, the rich folks are like, let me go buy a bunch of stuff to make it look like I'm wealthy, the more stuff I have, the wealthier I am. Well, then all the middle and lower classes want to do the same thing. So people make, so while the rich buy a bunch of luxury goods, making money for various businesses, the middle class and lower classes buy a bunch of imitations. Um, and that creates its own industry, which creates more jobs and creates more profit in general. Because, you know, you might not go out and buy Gucci, but you might buy some off-brand or whatever you're into buying. Um, so... Household goods were more commercially produced. Consumerism brought jobs and stimulated commerce. So, um, yeah, household goods were more com commercially produced. Consumerism brought jobs and stimulated uh, commerce. All right, next is consumer goods for the home. A number of factors resulted in an increased supply of and variety of consumer goods, especially due to, to trade, international trade. 
Lower income who couldn't buy luxury items made a market of lower cost imitations. Asian imported, imported ceramics like porcelain were so popular that imports couldn't keep up with demand. So Chinese, like you ever talk about fine China, it's because Europeans were obsessed with buying Chinese dishes and porcelain. So that term fine China, the, 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 the dishes themselves are not actually China. It's like porcelain was glass type structure, but that's because there was so much that came from China. That's where they get that name from. So there's so the, the porcelain was so popular that imports couldn't keep up with demand. This led to domestic ceramics becoming popular too, a lot of off-brand stuff. Entrepreneurs realized if upper class people bought something, there was a desire for middle and lower classes, so they began to make off you know off off-brand invitations. And so other items grew in demand too to help decorate your house or you know create luxury luxury items for your house like mirrors cotton and linen goods, and I don't mean like clothes, like, you know, curtains or decorations, silks, decorative prints, decorative prints being like wallpapers or, you know, different things that decorate your home. I have an image of that on the PowerPoint. Uh, jewelry as well. Ownership became a status symbol. So ownership of these goods became a status symbol. All right, food and drink. Uh, some of the most popular commodities of the 16, 1700s were consumables. Items, we've already discussed a lot of these, but like tea, coffee, Hot chocolate, liquors, liquors meaning like you know fancy drinks or alcoholic drinks. Sugar also became widely available and expensive, so sugar became much more the norm for all classes of Europeans in general. Now we're gonna uh, next look at new leisure venues. So different places become um, more common for people to go to and spend time, like coffee houses. Coffee houses and other public spaces sprang up, allowing shared social consumption of these new beverages mostly in urban areas, and they serve as a meeting place for all males in society of all classes. So uh, coffee houses and other public spaces spring up, allowing school shared social consumption of these new beverages, mostly in urban areas and served as a meeting place for all males in society. Women were sometimes proprietors or servers here, but they couldn't necessarily just go there with males. They uh, Coffee houses will decline in popularity in the 1800s as homes grow more comfortable and more private, so you don't have to go out to go talk to people. You can stay at your home and be private there and do whatever you want. Then you have lending, lending libraries, uh, which will also open making books and other printed materials available to those who couldn't afford them. In rural areas, <coughs> taverns were places to socialize, converse, dine, get drunk, whatever the case may be. Taverns can also offer sleeping accommodations. Back then, that's basically what a hotel was. Taverns would have a restaurant and bar below. Upstairs would usually be rooms for... Uh, sleeping in for boarding. Um, it was a lot of times taverns, in addition to, to being a uh, dining and sleeping place for travelers, it was the only outside place of the home you could go get food uh, before there was restaurants. Restaurants don't really get invented in, in France until the late 1700s. Sometimes you would see bars also called public houses, which is where the term pub comes from. Um, and lastly, theaters and opera houses developed due to dramatic population boom of urban areas. So with all the rise in middle class um, and people having money looking for things to do, they developed opera houses and theaters for people to go um, go watch plays and those kind of things. So we're going to stop the first video there and then we'll make a second video.